It is my absolute pleasure to have with us this morning, Perrin Kaplan. And as I mentioned in, in Slack here, she is recognized as one of the top 100 women in gaming. She's the former vice president of marketing and corporate affairs for Nintendo America. Perrin joined NOA in 1992 as their corporate communications manager. And as she rose in the company, oversaw the launch of Nintendo 64, GameCube, Wii, Game Boy Color, Game Boy Micro, Game Boy Advance, and the Nintendo DS. You forgot Virtual Boy. And the Virtual Boy. We're going to talk about the Virtual Boy. Little place in my heart for it. Um, at the time of her departure from NOA in 2009, Perrin oversaw all public relations, government affairs, investor relations, and internal communications for North American markets. It was also part of the overall leadership team at Nintendo. After exiting NOA, she, along with Nintendo leaders Beth Llewellyn and Kelly Koenig Horner, uh, left to form Zebra Partners, a marketing and PR firm in Seattle. And over the next 13 years, Zebra Partners has helped to launch global brand PR and strategies for some of the biggest players in the video games industry, including Sony, Bandai Namco, NCSoft, Oculus, DreamWorks Studios, and Microsoft. Is that pretty good? We can add several others. We just this last week have announced the Samsung Gaming Hub. Uh, Microsoft is one of their first, second, third customers awesome. with Game Pass. Awesome. 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 Very exciting. So, Perrin, thank you so much for taking time this morning to, to sit down and chat. And, you know, one of the reasons I started um, to try to build the series is to help share with you know my colleagues and and friends and community the people that have inspired me throughout my career you know in in the games industry and uh so i'm thrilled to have you here this morning so we can talk all about well you inspire me my dear friend oh uh, well thank you thank you, you are so, so full of love and life for this industry and i just you are the best oh <laughs> right. maybe one day I'll, I'll interview you see we'll go ahead and get that done <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. No worries. All right. So let's go start back at the beginning of your career. So you've spent your entire career in storytelling and marketing, building brands, public relations. So as a natural storyteller, I mean, was this something you were always interested in doing? You know, like where did this desire to tell those stories and, and build that career come from? How early on was this for you? I, I went to the University of Washington and was going to go into business administration or such. And I kind of started to be attracted to advertising. So I started to, to go down that path. And somewhere along the line there, as I stood outside, timidly outside with one of my high school girlfriends, peeking into the newsroom of the college radio station, um, and I was just, um, I, I just am so into music. I listen to music all day long. I'm into every new band, every everything. I mean, I just love it and know it all. I um, thought, oh gosh, if I could be a DJ, if I could do news for them, if I, I don't know, this just looks really, I just want in that room. So finally, the two of us like tiptoed in there, you know, scared of other college kids and um, ultimately became news director there and had my own weekend um, jazz show and then it was a new wave radio station so back then new wave was the thing and i had a great new wave show with uh, another dear friend who went on to have a really wonderful career as a as a dj and um got so much more than that and i just absolutely fell in love with the banter and the story and the go back and forth and had so much fun and became so close to all those people that I switched to kind of the communications realm. And I just remember being obsessed with getting like the perfect sound by something that was just a powerful punch. And mm. this is shows you <laughs> my age, we'd be in there with a razor blade cutting the perfect piece of tape and re-editing it and connecting it so that you would not hear a <laughs> on the tape <laughs> and getting just the perfect sound bite, you know, exactly that seven seconds of meaningfulness. And I just absolutely fell in love with it. And so then I wandered down to the NBC affiliate in, in Seattle and begged to be an intern, you know, all right. I'll, I'll, I'll lick the floors, I'll right. do whatever. But, but now, before you go into that part of it, since you were a DJ and New Wave, what was your favorite? Yes, I mean, like, what I was, was, what, yes, it's that radio voice. Um, what was, what was your favorite 
new wave band that you played? I was really into Duran Duran. I was really Seven and the yeah. Ragged Tiger. Yes. Right? I phenomenal, just, phenomenal album. Yeah, just so good, <laughs> I'd say. Many others, but that was probably my first love where I was like, new wave is it, and now new wave is old wave. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> but it was hot, hot, and so good. That's and it had right. just a real punk feel to it. It was so great. Oh, yeah. So, you know, spending all that time with my friends doing, you know, music and, ha- you know, having my DJ shows and partying with those people and telling stories was great. That's awesome. So, all right. Yeah. So post-college, you became a reporter at King Broadcast. Now, you said I that did. you got in there. It was do anything that you could to be in the door. I, I had the same experience going to Sun. You know, I was the gopher for the commercial team, making coffee, picking up dry cleaning. I offered copies. to lick the floors, but <laughs> they, I didn't have to. Right. But I had the most wonderful editor as a teacher. And in fact, I just saw her in the last year and a half or so. And it was just incredible. And I told her the impact she had on me. And she just looked at me like I was crazy. But she taught me how to how to tell a good story. And I do remember my very first news story, and it was about a robbery at a grocery store. And I wrote the story, and I was so proud of it. I was like, this is going to go on the air in 60 seconds because it was a really intense news cycle. Right. It was a grocery store, and it was what happened at the store. And she said, this is really great. Where's the store? What store? <laughs> I'm like, oh, I said it was a Safeway, which is a common store here. Just, yeah, there's like a hundred of them. So (laughs) anyway, I became an editor and reporter there. And then I decided, here's just like the key moment. I was having to do stories. Some of them were really awful. There were, you know, murders and all kinds of things. And, you know, you got assigned what you got assigned. And um there's a big windstorm one day and there was a fellow reporter who had to go cover the story and he was asked to go out to this bridge that links Seattle over to the east side where Microsoft and Nintendo and everybody is. And it was just swaying and he was asked to go out and be in the traffic there and give like a big traffic report of the weather, weather and stuff. So I assigned him to go do that. And, you know, 15, 20 minutes later, so he does his live piece 15, 15 minutes later, he shows back up. I'm like, Tony, how'd you get back so fast? He's like, are you kidding? I was on the roof of the building. I am not going out and doing that stuff. And it just like made me ponder. I was like, you know, I, I just, hmm. And at the same time, I had a girlfriend call me and she had a job that was a little bit more in the, in the governmental political arena. And I normally wouldn't have been attracted to that. But she said, you get to make some news down here. And I thought, there's just so much more power in making news than telling news. Yeah. So I switched to the side where you could really story tell interesting things. I got really interested in the environment and a variety of other things. And then had a couple other really interesting job stints that I won't bore you with. But I got recruited out of absolute left field to a place called Nintendo. So I went for my first interview and I had not been exposed to any of this. And you have to remember, you know, there wasn't a lot of Google and all that. Oh, sure. And I had my meeting was in the Donkey Kong room. And I thought, who are these people? What is this? <laughs> I'm so confused. Okay, so, so let me pause you there for just a second. So when you um, when you moved from doing reporting to PR and public affairs. And one of the things you touched on is the power of efficient and compelling storytelling, right? How do you get right to the punch, to the heart of things, which of course now we're experiencing, uh, you know, with the three to four second attention span that, you know, our kids have, right? Um, How about two to three? Yeah, even even better or worse. Um, but what, what would you say were the biggest differences between kind of the art of storytelling and reporting versus PR and public affairs. Did you find there were... In my opinion, well, reporting is often to be the facts, but a good reporter tells it in a compelling way. So some of the best reporters are very well schooled in a great large vocabulary. So they will use words that are just just a little more sophisticated but compelling words um 
So they're still telling a story that way. They're bringing it to life. They're, they're using words that paint the picture that make it visual. Right. Right. In my opinion, and I was, you know, a tough boss this way. And I, I've been told that I taught a lot of people and I'm, I hope that that's true. I learned a lot from a lot of people. And this started with the editor at the NBC affiliate. People in PR who've not been schooled this way tell the story that they think their co the company wants them to tell. Mm -hmm. I tell a story that I know people want to hear. And it's got to be a story that's factual, but visual in a way that they can see it and understand right. it. And it has to still be true, but it also has to be narrowed down to tell people what they want to know. All the fluff and garbage around it to me, I don't care about that. Right. The whole big setup, the whole whatever, what's the deal is what you need to tell people. Right. Yeah. And it's not, as you pointed out, so many companies, when they think about their messaging, they want to talk about, you know, their technology and what it does and how much they put into it and how many people. But if we can't tell people why it's important, how yeah, it's going it to make their lives them? better. Exactly. Why should they care? Right. Then it's, you know, then we're just talking about commodities, right? We're talking yeah. about commoditized, uh, you know, uh, you know, systems and, and services. So it's really important that people understand how it's going to make their lives better, right? And you and I have had this conversation in the past. For me, it's um, if you can't build something that makes, you know, life better for the people who create and the people who dedicate time to using it, then kind of what are we doing, right? Kind exactly. Of, so. exactly. All right. So let's jump straight to Nintendo. So in 92... Yay. You joined Nintendo America. All right. So first, I did you go playing any video games? You know, well, so I went in and I was in this Donkey Kong room, and this this gentleman, um, these two gentlemen walked in, and it's Mr. Arakawa and it's Howard Lincoln, and I'm like, cool, cool. You know, inability to Google these people. I hear the top of the top. So we had this conversation, and I, you know, we had a great conversation because I knew the field of. PR and news and all that really, really well. And I said, you know, why me? Why did you want to talk to me? And they brilliantly, Howard Lincoln knows how I feel about him. Mr. Arkawa, too. They said, we want someone who knows nothing about our industry, which is very young, to come in and tell us what to do. We don't, we don't, we know we need this, but we don't know anything about it. We want someone with really fresh eyes. We don't have anyone in the company that we think can take us where we need to go and we need a professional to do this. And, and they picked me and I'm just so great. It changed the course of my life in the best way ever. Now, ever. for people that are listening right now, so Mr. Arakawa, it was the CEO of Nintendo of America. Yes, and the and son of Mr. Yamanchi, the creator of yes. Nintendo. Yep, and then Howard Lincoln was the uh, basically chief legal counsel, right? For yes. the chief lawyer yes. for, yeah. for the company. There's a wonderful book called uh, Game Over, Press Start to Continue, uh, mm -hmm. that had editions by Andy, Eddie, that talk about the early days of them growing the business here and all of the, you know, the ups and downs and the, the close calls. Um, so it's really a wonderful book if people want to go ahead and take a look at it. So you now are sitting with, you know, two of the people that basically not only helped save the games industry, but really changing with the video games industry here you know, in, in the West. So when you first, you know, joined the company, what was it like? Like, well, how I, did you I, feel? Was it like I being looked, in Wonka's factory or? Well, well, here's the beauty of it and why um, I've had the most blessed, stupendous career. It was a small company with a growing large name. So there really, truly were like 15 of us. At that time, out of a company, I think they probably had maybe, I don't know, 100 people who were running stuff and making these major decisions. And I worked with Howard every day and worked with Arakawa so often to understand and learn why their brilliant miles, minds created these programs that made third-party publishers get such great exposure, become wealthy, become like the dynamic of what they created, created something that just absolutely blew up. And there were so many people that benefited and were so happy. And so many people then thought, I want to get into that. Like, this is super creative. This is amazing. Um, 
you know, and they'd already been established. They had already been doing um, arcade and the NES had launched and had done exceedingly well. So they were well on their way. They just needed to have the story be told. They, mm-hmm. I think the NES had already been in 36 million homes. And that was all, you know, early advertising, but a lot of it was super viral. So they knew they had a little something. And so I walked into just a really fantastic foundation to, to build from, you know, very lucky me. But I had the well, blessing of learning it from the inside out. So when you say it's Willy Wonka's factory, you know, it's interesting. I look back and I know how lucky I was. I talked to so many other people who've had great executive careers. They did not have the inside the closet look and conversations that I got to have. Many of them did. Many, many did. But many did not get to because the company had already been established. Right. I was there during like the continued birthing of it. I'm so, it was so much fun. Okay, but so to be fair, Nintendo was also lucky to get you in at that time. And I say that, be, you know, knowing you and the, the career that you've had, but also because at the time, Nintendo was facing some headwinds in the Western market that they just hadn't before. They single-handedly reinvigorated the the home console market. You've gone on record to talk about the importance of the Nintendo seal of quality in terms of building trust back with, you know, with parents after the collapse of the games industry back in 1983, right? With Atari and and Intellivision, Coleco, and the myriad of companies that came out of the woodwork making garbage, right? To cloning all of those machines. Nintendo was able to put a, a quality and assurance back into the psyche of the American consumer. Um, but, and so they had th- this nice long run, biggest competitor, which was Sega, um, to Nintendo, right? Coming over to the West, didn't do well with their initial systems to compete with NES. But you joined at a time where things were a little bit different, right? This is when, right, right those in the industry we call it the console wars, right? It was in full swing. Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. you know, w- after Sega made some very uh, aggressive and creative moves to establish a toehold, uh, in, in the U.S. market, it created some new pressure for Nintendo that they just hadn't experienced before. So what was the feeling it, at Nintendo at the time? Was this part of why they believed they needed a, an amazing storyteller from outside of the industry to better tell the story that they may not have been able to tell themselves? So that I came before that all occurred. Mm-hmm. So they didn't hire me because of any of that. They hired me when times were, were good, but they were on the downside of NAS and they were um, like had just launched or were launching. It was like right in the middle of the launch of the SNES. Mm-hmm. Um, so it wasn't a crisis hire by any means. And one thing I do want to say when you ask about joining and Willy Wonka's factory is that when you you know how you get a feeling in a company you get the vibe you get the everything Mm -hmm. nintendo stands for quality and it is it is part of the air you breathe there that the products that they make are all about quality and you will not find ever anyone saying i can't believe such and such returned this or i mean if anything is not right immediately it will be fixed yeah. You know, something has to play well. It has to do well. It's The idea is not to make the money simply. It is about to bring joy to households. And that ethos is, it is carved into every wall. And I felt so uh, good about working with a company that that is literally the, the air they breathed. Um, when and it I came would, to I, would the- say, I was going to say, Parent, too, I mean, that's, you know, one of the leadership principles at AWS is being customer obsessed. Right, which, what do we need to do to make this right for the customer? How do we go ahead and get things taken care of? That's, and that's right. Part of the same, you know, ethos, you know, over here, as as well. And I would also like to mention, and, and too, very much. Think- and while we've been on here, I've had my um, Amazon box dropped on my porch. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> awesome. A- AWS awesome. runs the world, though. Of also, course. there we go. Um, but what I would also say is, you know, to your point, if you look at a modern um, example of the way Nintendo approaches their their consumers, if people don't know this, um, if you buy a Switch game, a physical cartridge, don't put it in your mouth, because they actually added a bittering agent to the plastic, so the taste is disgusting. 
And the reason so kids that, won't eat it. So kids won't swallow it. So it's not just thinking about the technology, but who they're serving and 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 why and how to really care for them yeah. as you know, and not just a customer, but as a partner in you know, engaging in their content and their art and their storytelling. So, mm -hmm. all right. So, mm -hmm. um, so all of this stuff is kind of imbued there. Um, and, and then Sega happens. Then Sega happens. So now you've got, um, you know, this, this community, again. That's when community. Nasty Perrin showed up. Right. So, you know, Sega does what Nintendo don't, right? That was kind of their big, you know, push into there. Now you're in yeah. here leading this new strategy against this, this, this type of advertising that we really hadn't seen in the games industry uh, before. So it, it is new, not just for Nintendo, but kind of the industry overall. So someone leading a new strategy, what were the key things you needed to kind of change or you know, what was kind of your, your thought at the time? Well, I will say that across the company, it was a little bit of here comes another competitor that won't make it. We've had so many, it's like they're not gonna penetrate the wall. Um, and that was not the right thought process to have. And I was a little confused by that. I was like, why would you have to take every competitor seriously? And it's not that they didn't take Sega seriously. It's just that they didn't think probably they'd make it as far as they did. And I remember the commercial where they had, you know, I think Mario was walking so slow that Sonic had to pick him up in his car in the race or something like yeah, the, remember, the, 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 race, was, the race cars, the drag strip yeah, and then the yeah. Mario Kart one. Right. Yeah. 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 And I remember thinking in my mind, okay, now I'm pissed. <laughs> now I'm mad. <laughs> um, and it was around the time and I'm going to get my dates a little mixed up, but it was around the time that Sega was going to come out with this night trap stuff. Mm -hmm. I do remember night trap. Oh, sure. do. Absolutely. Dana Plato's last uh, recorded piece of uh, film actually well i'm really nasty we we thought that was like violent and not nice against women and it wasn't and it was creepy and all kinds of stuff and so we packaged that up and sent that to media and said you should be focusing on these guys you should take a deeper look at their ethos mm -hmm. like they're introducing some not good stuff to young men and this just is not cool all fair but, you know, that's a public affairs move. So we did that. And they it was did that, get... It was actually part of the congressional hearings, right? Well, it led to the congressional hearings. Right. So it was, there was a focus. Mm -hmm. So we diverted attention there. And then congressional hearings occurred, and they were like, we need to start raiding this industry. They've got all this bad stuff. And so... Um, Smartly, I invited Senator Lieberman to please fly out to Nintendo first and experience our products before any kind of hearing. And, you know, that's public affairs, too. And he rolled up his sleeves to play some Mario, and he really got into it, really enjoyed it. And we were able to spend some time and talk about the differences in company and our family focus and just um, what to look for and also to be fully aware that the people on his staff that are assessing games are not gamers and they're only going to get as far into the game as the skill will allow them at that time. Right. And so they're going to take snippets that may not be representative of a whole product. Yeah. So um, we showed up at the hearing, I think, in a slightly more favorable, favorable position. Mm -hmm. And um, so Howard Lincoln was there, you know, I was there. The individual representing Sega has, was someone who had just left Nintendo. Mm -hmm. So he was, yes. I but, I mean, Sega. But, th but that was also an important um, uh, moment in the game's history because it, that was really the moment when government could have stepped in to regulate the industry. And the industry kind of took a step back and said, hold on a minute. Um, we believe that we are closer to the movie industry than government regulation. So let us go ahead and form basically the video game rating system, which eventually came the ESRB, the ESRB. right? Which Pat Vance one is one of our uh, wonderful clients to this day. And I love right. Pat. Yeah, Pat's awesome. So she is awesome. So I, I was lucky enough to be there at the creation of that. And yeah. It was, you know, the warning was made internally. I said, you know, I have a lot of experience in government. 
uh, because I haven't talked about all the political stuff I did, which we don't need to belabor, belabor, but I understood the system very well and said, they're not kidding. And if you want to be regulated by the government, you're going to do this in a real sloppy way. If you want to take care of your own business, you're going to do this in a real, real way. Right. Um, and the movie industry is a really good, fair comparison. So if you're going to do it, you're going to do it right. And you're going to have people that rate these games be unknown. You're not going to be negotiating with them. You're not going to bargain with them. It's going to be real. And so the industry did a fantastic job of constructing that. And to this day, they do a wonderful job. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely agree. All right. So... We now have the government off of the games industry's back. We're now kind of in control of being responsible stewards of art, making its way out in, into the world. But Sega is still our competitor. Sega is still your competitor. But they're also your partner. There are more Sonic games and, and Sega games now on Nintendo yeah, you know, products right. and platforms. But, you know, I understand that. Being a, you know, a very early Sun Microsystems you know, person, yes. there are other big companies that are still, you know, in existence. So no Peter Moore is. and I became fast friends. I love him dearly. Peter's he wonderful. Was, he is wonderful. He was the head of Sega at that time. And yeah. uh, he, he, that's how we got to know each other. He's wonderful. But I will say that at one moment, I sat around with the team and I said, you know, how bad would it be if we had a dump truck of bananas and we just rolled into the Sega parking lot and alerted the press, and we unloaded all those bananas in the parking lot and left. <laughs> How bad would that be? We decided uh-huh. not to do it because that's food waste, but yes, I was pretty close, let me but just then, tell so, you. But, but then remember, Sony kind of went ahead and did that with uh, Crash Bandicoot, where they got actor in a Bandicoot costume to go into Sega Nintendo's parking lots and start yelling yep. at everybody. Yep. So, all right, we've got all of these <laughs> awesome marketing stories. But I want to focus on kind of your your time at Nintendo and some of the, these uh, key pieces here. So you're at NOA, you're leading this team. Um, there's a new transition to new systems as Nintendo is kind of forging their way forward into a new era of, of technology. So over the next five years, right in the beginning part of your tenure, We have new systems that come to market. Nintendo 64, the Virtual Boy, Game Boy Color, they're all on the horizon. So um, let's talk about them one at a time. Uh, The Game Boy Color, right, was meant to extend the life of the Game Boy market. Um, So what was the marketing concepts that you and your team developed um, around this? I, I know there was the Play It Loud campaign and Escape to a World of Color. So here you've got this legacy product, you now have to extend its life. What were you know kind of some of the key uh, things that you brought to these marketing campaigns to do that? One of Nintendo's Nintendo has um, slow cycles with its products, and it will find iterations of the product for, at that time would found iterations of the products. So something would go you know dual screen, or that it would go color, or what have you. So. Um, going color, that was the first time that that had happened. It was really kind of cool. And so we just had to get really creative about how to play differently and how to play loudly and how to free yourself. And I mean, all those bright colors really signified opening up and celebrating. And it just signified the energy of of gaming mm-hmm. and of people and the diversification of it. And so... Uh, we we went so far as to you know during spring break, I don't think that this would happen today, but we had the painted bodies of Game Boy, mm-hmm. the painted bodies of Spring Break, where you know people got to paint each other's bodies, and you can imagine what happened between lots of people <laughs> during spring break. We had these paints that were like edible, and people were busy painting each other, and then we had you know demo stations everywhere and. So we just got energetic and creative with it. Um, You know, we wanted people to play aloud, which was, you know, the whole play aloud theme and the whole energy theme and introducing the colors kind of one by one. And then, you you know, expand it. Um, Mm -hmm. It was super fun to do. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, and I do remember those yeah. campaigns and the tongues that were all different colors. So you yes. could taste the yes. game and all yes. that kind of stuff. Yes. And, and it worked yeah. well. It worked well. It extended that that brand and that life to another generation and, and kind of you know, another rising um, uh, tide in, in the marketplace there. So you continue moving Game Boy forward. And now you have the newest creation, 
by Gunpei Yokoi, the yes. virtual boy, the man who invented Game and Watch, and I believe it was the what so is it, the, the Ultra, the Ultra Arm, you know, the the spring loaded uh, boxing glove. He, yeah, the, he um, that back in the day. Power. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, yeah, I forget the name of that too. And then yeah. so he did Game Boy as well, and now he presents the Virtual Boy. So. Yeah. What was the thinking at the time? Was you know, this the thinking was brilliant. And I have to say that of all the products that Nintendo tried, it became the virtual dog, D-O-G. <laughs> it was really cool when we first got to try it over here in Seattle. It was really cool. We're like, wow, this is a really different, a different dimension. It's really cool. There's not enough content in here, um, but this is cool. Hopefully, they'll have more examples. Then I flew to Japan, and we were at one of the we were at um, Shoshinkai, the big show, and the Virtual Boy was everywhere and being demoed. And I remember a conversation with our headquarters that we weren't sure if young people's developing eyes would do well with this. We didn't know that it would impact it or not, if it would impact it or not. And likely not, but it was like, we we have a problem. The bottom line is it was a great concept. It was brought to market when it probably shouldn't have been. I think it was a great show of what the future will hold. I mean, just think about it conceptually, where we are in VR and everything else. I mean, how foretelling, how fantastic, how incredible, just the idea. like how many years ago that was and look at where we are so that part was really cool but we just had to stop making it and stop selling it because it it was too too ahead of its time and not ready and not ready for young people yeah so that's why it became the virtual dog but Joe, what I, I what I it was cool looking it was cool looking I had a little spaceship with legs I had one, and one of the things I remember is that if you played it long enough and you were in a dark room and you picked your head up you could see in the dark because you know, basically all yeah, of the you had laser eyeballs, pretty much. Yeah. But yeah. what I find fascinating about the Virtual Boy, and it is something that Nintendo does frequently, is they experiment with new types of technologies and way to play that a lot of other companies don't, and they do it in a very public and visible way, right? right? And that's been kind of a hallmark of Nintendo's and kind of some of their internal philosophy, you know, game as toy, like how do we we kind of play together? We're going to actually talk about that tagline a little bit later. So we're going to move on quickly. Okay. The iconic Nintendo 64. So this is the first real competitor uh, to that leap forward in, in 3D uh-huh. gaming, right? Sega has the Saturn, um, Sony has PlayStation, Nintendo comes out with the Nintendo 64. Just a quick aside, when I first started focusing on video games at Sun, um, I had been, you know, out pounding the the pavement and knocking on doors, trying to get them to understand what was going to happen. And I was walked into a Sun lab and there was a Nintendo 64 they brought over from Japan with, you know, with uh, Mario 64. And I was like, I cannot believe what I'm seeing right now, right? All right, Uh so let's talk about... The Ultra 64, which well, I couldn't believe what I was 64. seeing. So, and I worked there. The fact that you could go off screen and go somewhere with him was mind blowing. Yeah, that you could see. I think it was. It wasn't quite 360 degrees. It was 180 degrees. It was something. Yeah, I you can't feel remember. the view, but then you can yeah. move. Yeah, yeah, anywhere you wanted. And it was just like. Are you kidding me? Am I in a dream? Am I having like a little dream here? Is this, is it nighttime? Um, Just unbelievable. And I have to say that we all were absolutely chomping at the bit to get to show this to people because it was so, it wasn't like, oh my God, Nintendo is so competitive. People are going to love this and we're going to do so well. It was, I can't believe what I've seen. I have to show this to other people. They are going to just not believe it. And it was just so cool. It's just, it, that's what I have to say. It was just, I just remember this moment of thinking, oh my gosh. Well, and then this is a pivot, right? For the company. So the campaigns that you led were things like change the system or yeah. get in and get out, right? So yeah. Yeah. they really felt that this was a, a, a pivotal moment for the company and the type of games, the type of experiences that they were going to build. 
correct? And it also changed the way developers view things. It was almost like it gave, if we can do it, so can you. It gave developers permission. Look, look, look what we figured out. You can do this too. It's like, you know, when people are trained to do things a certain way, you try to think outside the box, but you don't go that far. Right. 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 I mean, we're in a different dimension and different era now, but yeah. it what then people started really exploring, you yeah. know, the field of view and the movement all the way around. Which and it did. was just, and the Mario music and, you know, Miyamoto and his team did such a freaking beautiful job. Oh, yeah. I mean, just, it was just sweet, such sweetness. That's And I love the way you, you phrase it. It was sweet, right? Because now oh, it gave sweet. some physicality to Mario and that the environment and that world that we hadn't experienced before. So it was a whole new way of getting reintroduced to the world that then became the foundation for the rest of, you know, the Mario Prize going forward. I should also mention, uh, it's just a, another thought that popped in. The gentleman that I first worked with when I convinced Sun to focus on games was a gentleman named Tetsuya Mori. He was the business development lead at SGI that worked on oh my the goodness. Project Reality chipset. Oh which, my goodness! Right, and so on his desk he had in loose sight the actual, you know, a die. Oh yeah, my yeah, goodness! Just given out to all. So we loved working with SGI, yeah. Silicon Graphics, um, yeah. and Project Reality. We got to name. A, we we would sit around a table and come up with these things, and Project Reality. You know, things were were becoming just more. 3D, 2D, real. Yeah. yeah I mean, um, the next big one, right? And one that a lot of people that played in the N64 era remember is GoldenEye. That game just changed everything, right? We had yeah. so much fun launching it. We had a tank with Grace Jones. Okay, you know, that's Grace, pretty, Grace yes, Jones. yes. Yeah, Grace Jones. And yes. remember, this is when, like, all these martini bars were opening up. This was, like, the big thing. Yeah. She comes roaring down in Manhattan, you know, raising her. She's like all dressed. It's golden eye, baby. And this tank rolls up and drops her off at this venue where we are having a huge VIP event. Mm -hmm. I thought I was dressed so cool. I look back at the pictures and I'm like, oh, geez, I could have picked something better. Perrin, you don't look back. Do not do Google searches. Just we don't yeah, look I know. back at our fashions pretty, from those guys. Yes. I cannot put that toothpaste back in the tube. <laughs> And it was this huge martini event we were happen having with, you know, VIP people, all kinds of media. Um, one of the members of our team um, was super excited because she was in the game. She's like this little, you know, human walking around and that she got to see herself. And after, you know, the evening went on, talking to Grace, she was just so lovely. She decided to call my husband. So here's my husband at work because, you know, we're in, in New York and it's a different time zone. She calls, Tim, it's Grace Jones. <laughs> and he's like, what? Is it really you? And I'm in the background. Yes, it's really her. We're here celebrating Golden Eye. You really should be here. It's so great. You so know, you, you like, got the next call from Tim going, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, he's like, wow, how many martinis did you give her? And I'm like, no, she comes that way. She was so lovely and so full of life. But we had just awesome. this massive thing. And um, and the guys from Rare were there. That was back yeah. in the day when we were working with them. And yeah. that was all good. And GoldenEye has remained a golden, golden game for even to today. It's still Absolutely. a great game. Absolutely. And it's one that's even played in competition still to this day, right? So yeah. it, pretty amazing. All right. Why do, you, so, why do you think people liked it so much or like I, it so much? Because it was the first time that allowed for four players to sit in front of one TV and play together. So this blew yeah. up in college campuses, right? Yeah. In living rooms and dens of people all across you know, the U.S. And it had a really um, good set of play mechanics that people could modify. So there's a, you know, a mode that people play. It's like, you know, slaps. So no weapons. You're only able to use your hands, right, to take each other down. So through the game, people created their own meta version, right, uh, of, of how to play. And I think, again, it was just, it was the right technology, right time. We hadn't seen this before. It was accessible from a price and an engagement perspective. And once again, it was Nintendo um, tapping into you know, what consumers and players wanted and how to go to bring that forward, but do it in Nintendo style. Yeah. Right? Really yeah. do it in Nintendo style. All right. Just playing games is a singular, you know. Used to be. Was. Right? 
Yeah. yeah. And, you know, and that's the thing. Um, when we talk about why, you know, where games are today, you know, there was a brief moment in his, in human history where computers acted kind of as the surrogate, you know, human player. And there was, but we've been playing games with each other since we started recording history as human beings. Oh, right, that's on this right. Planet. Absolutely. So there was this brief moment of time where we didn't require another person to play. But once we enabled multiplayer it just took it, internet, took it way up. Right. It, it Absolutely. came roaring back in. All right. Humans now, need humans. Of course, which absolutely. And even if we're able to get together like this and play yeah. or face-to-face. Or, we'll take or, it. Uh, we'll, we will yeah, take we'll it. We'll take it. We'll All right. It. So now it's a 2000. All right. Game industry is completely in full tilt. New s- systems and technology is coming out, you know, like crazy, right? It stuff is, is just progressing really, really fast. And I get a job offer from Jeff Bezos. You did. Ooh. And I went and met with him and okay. I fell in love with him. And I just thought he is the best of the best. And, and then flowers were sent. <laughs> and then I said, no, because I wanted to stay at Nintendo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, w- I could be talking to you from my rocket ship right now. <laughs> but I didn't. I'm talking to you from my home office desk. Hey, and I'm doing the same, but we do it because, you know, I, I think anybody that's spent enough time growing up in this industry and has had the chance to see the things that, you know, you know, influencers and leaders like you have know that it is really about pursuing the things that you're passionate about. Yeah, I would have left all to, this. Yeah, and you would have, and applying who you are to the things that you care about, right? Which we're also going to talk about a bit later about the philanthropic stuff that you do. But let me get you back into the 2000s here. So we have three new systems that are coming out. No, two new systems. We've got the Game Boy Advance and the GameCube. So Game Boy Advance is a completely, uh, you know, it, it is a huge generational leap forward for a handheld. Tell us quickly about it's hor- it's horizontal success. It's horizontal. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a different shape. It's a refresh. It's modern. Mm-hmm. It's lighter. It's battery life is long. It's not the size of a doorstop. Door, doorstop, is that what it's called? Yeah, doorstop. doorstop. Mm-hmm. Um, on the same side, it's... Oh, my goodness. It's just It's like a Super Nintendo in your pocket. And we hadn't yeah. seen a system that advanced before. Right. right. And and some of the taglines and, and marketing around that were, you know, play it cool, right? Get into the game, escape, right? So because follow- you just could do so much more. The games, um, the memory was longer. There you just could you you could just play so much more deeply. Right. Um it just took everything up completely like six levels. Mm-hmm. And so marketing, that was really fun. It was sort of like, we know you love Game Boy and we know you'll always love Game Boy, but the things that you wish Game Boy could do, guess what? Here we are. Yeah. Yep. You know, here, here we are and it's horizontal and the screen's bigger and it's going to be more comfortable to hold. You could just like rest it right there and just, it's intuitive. Um, it was brilliant design, brilliant yep. design. Absolutely. And I have all of my... GBAs and every version of the city back there. I should have brought them up here as props for us today. But um, it, so, yeah, it, it did. Again, it, it did bring that 16 bit kind of um, game aesthetic and deeper gameplay to the, the portable market. Yeah, it was and then, faster. Games yeah, are faster. Exactly. And then you have um, the GameCube, which is launched, right? So a beloved system by Nintendo fans. Um, but not this uh, uh, smash it like the prior Nintendo consoles, right? Um, a little bit of a makeup box. It, it was very, handle. it was very sweet. It, it was, it, it was, was uh, very kitten cute. caboodles carry box. That's right. I think uh, it. I think it. Um, I think it came out at a time. It wasn't a big leap mm-hmm. at all. And I remember going into a room that had been set up at Donkey Kong room, room where my career started there, where Japan had set up all the different colors so that we could help like pick which color we thought might be best to launch in the U.S. market. I, of course, did not pick purple. 
um, I didn't. My favorite color, and, if you couldn't tell, you know, with these, all this. I, I love it. It turned yeah. out to be right, but I was just really nervous about the male audience. Right. But some of the colors that they had there, I don't know if they were messing with us or what, but some of them were like cement color, you know, puke color, <laughs> you know, cat food color. <laughs> like, what's going on here? Moss green. Some of them, others were really pretty, but you know, not quite right. Um, like a bright yellow and whatnot. But um, but there must have been there was like a sea of them. Probably was like twenty or thirty different samples. It it was just a nice step up. It wasn't like a leap, and I think people needed that. And it was happening at a time where other systems were coming out that really focused on power. Yeah. But I so think it was, it was hard to escape that comparison. Yeah. And I think, though, looking back, though, and people that collect and, and um, still it's play a, today recognize some of the, you yeah. know, the hidden gems in there. Um, that the small really, disc was cool. It, it was yeah, right. But at the time when the rest of the world was moving to um, CDs and then DVDs. And so Nintendo was cautiously kind of moving into that space. But once again, hitting on the theme of trying experimental things directly out there in the public, um, there were some games where you could take the Game Boy Advance and plug it into the GameCube and use it as an intelligent controller. So Link for Swords Adventure, um, the Pac-Man game that uh, uh, Miyamoto-san demonstrated where the individual players are the ghosts and the Pac-Man you know, character is on the screen. So again, Nintendo is still willing to to think differently about right. How, right. what what it means to play together, right? It's true. It's true. And at that time, um, I mean, everyone started comparing us, and I, it's logical. I would have too. You know, Sony, Nintendo, Microsoft. Mm -hmm. Nintendo does not see itself in that lineup. Right. It never has. It, it. You know, we watch the numbers. We watch all that's happening with the other companies, but. Nintendo speaks to its own, it goes to its own beat. It, yep. it, you know, Mr. Iwata once wisely told me, you can spend all your time on competitors, but you really should just be looking forward to doing what you do best and create in a way that, you know, is for you. And, you know, a lot of American businesses just are in deep analysis looking at what everyone else does. Yeah. And, you know... It just was a, it was a really interesting piece of advice that I learned from him. And, you know, I think we're moving right into that era when uh, Mr. Iwata, you know, took over as the CEO of, of Nintendo. And I remember I was at GDC when he uh, introduced the Wii controller. Nobody had ever seen this before. And I remember him taking the stage. And I mean, it was like tears in, in the audience because he yes. said he came out, he bowed deeply and he said, um, my business card says, yeah. you know, CEO, my head says programmer, but my heart says games. I mean, yes. my head literally it's just standing yeah. up and he meant that, it. And that was imbued in the next product that, yes. that Nintendo brought forward that, you know, you were instrumental in, in marketing and bringing to the world. The two big ones. Now we're going to talk about the Nintendo DS. And then of course the Wii, which fundamentally changed the way the family unit thought about video games and what games mm -hmm. could mean, right? It was an so, industry shift for sure. I'm so proud of the work there. And rightly you should be. And he so, is deeply missed. He is deeply missed. Uh, I, I have his book that I've yet to, to finish reading, but uh, yeah, um, was, um, was a real loss. And I think his impact on the industry could be seen by his contemporaries in competing companies coming forward at that time and saying how much he meant to them, right? And again, it, it was an era that just changed, I think, the way the industry thought about itself. But yes. let's go ahead and take it down to these two products. Um, the DS, yes. the first and only dual screen game console in history, right? It was a smash success. Um, it's a lineage that lasted you know, more than a decade. Um, but in the beginning, you're faced with marketing promoting a system and technology that have never been seen before. I remember some of the the detract detractors and 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 you know pieces that were written. 
but campaigns like touching is good and touch yeah. me, like yeah. very different for Nintendo. Yeah, Tell us I remember. I don't know if you can hear the dogs barking in the background. That's okay. That's I'm right. so sorry. Hey, this is what it's like working from home. Well, it yes, it's true. Um, it was risque, and I do remember the hallways of work. We would all, you know, I'd stop by someone's office and say, hey, don't forget, touching is good. So <laughs> we all were like, hey, touch that, because touching is good. Eat that sandwich. Touch that sandwich. Touching's good. It was really risque for us. Nintendo was not known for that kind of thing. Super risque. <laughs> but it also made sense, because yes. you just have to touch it. Um we were faced with the dual screen, and I have to say the advertising part was easier. The touching is good. That was all kind of an easier play. The PR side of it was harder because people literally did not understand it. And when you explained that you could start drawing something on one end and take it all the way to the other screen, I mean, we just got a lot of blank stares. Right. It was so unique and different. Mm -hmm. You know, we're, we're trained to, to do things the exact certain way. Right. It was so uniquely different um, that a couple of the first efforts in communicating it really were kind of failures. Mm -hmm. So we had to really recollect ourselves to figure out how do we simply communicate what this is and what it does and why it matters a bit of a struggle yeah so um we worked our way and decided that just as much hands-on as we could give reporters so that they spent time personally with the experience was probably the best way to go yeah so, i remember but, one of the first games they was uh it was actually done by sega one of the biggest competitors uh -huh. but it was called feel the magic and oh yeah the, the main characters <laughs> were the rub yes. rabbits and you yes. look at this going <laughs> What? what is going on? And what is touching is good. I'm That's... like, what is happening? That's right. Yeah. But the physicality yeah. of that then extended. And so, yeah, Nintendo DS, amazing platform, which went through multiple iterations, right? The, the Nintendo DSi and then the Nintendo DS XL. Um, and then, of course, to the N Nintendo 3DS and the 3DS XL and the two. So it's had an incredibly long and, again, uh, loved history, right? In, in games with incredible games that, that came out that just couldn't be done on any other system. Right. But the system that was probably the biggest seismic shift has to be Nintendo Wii, right? And I just remember with the first time I saw the We Would Like to Play campaign, and I could not... Uh, uh, the brilliance of that campaign was extraordinary J just because it told you everything about why you would want to use the product and most Not of the just ads what it was well and mo and most of the ads all of the ads you saw were from the u.s that you ever saw this yep. came from japan that we would like to play mm -hmm. it was their idea yeah, I mean, it was... Again, and, and usually you don't get things that are universal, mm -hmm. you know, globally universal. And so we had to shoot it in a way that was their idea. And it kind of was one of those moments where, like you're saying about Iwata, it just was so perfect. Yeah. Yep. That's again, all, it's all you needed to say. Right. It didn't need, it didn't talk. This was the point where it didn't talk about specs of the machine, didn't talk about, you know, graphic level output. It didn't talk about the amount of memory, didn't talk about any of those things, but it told you why you wanted this, because now we will play together. And again, it was a, a brilliant way to express these kind of very new ideas and concepts that, you know, just was, you know, it, well, yeah, and what you're supposed to do with it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then, of course, this is also the era where um, Nintendo entered into the digital distribution uh, era, right? So WiiWare and starting to experiment online, right? And takes us to where we are today with the Nintendo Switch. And you look at the, you know, the amount of content that's now available in their marketplace. I mean, it's literally yeah. thousands and thousands. Yes, you yes. Know, you know, of we had a bumpy so. start there. I'd say that we were... Um, 
we were a little half pregnant for a bit. <laughs> but yeah. is that different? Is that different than in any other point in Nintendo's history? Probably not. Um, where it's well, let's I will try. Right? Well, let's I will see. say, and then I'd love to share just briefly how we launched the Wii, that some Please. of the, um, the considerations. Japan was not a thousand percent on board that online would move as quickly as it ended up moving over here. Mm -hmm. So they were committed, but it was sort of like, mm, let's poke at this, but not throw a million people at it. Right. So that's why I say half pregnant. But then I think when they realized it's something that people really wanted, people were like, hey, this is not giving me enough or, you know, why wasn't this updated or what, you know, wanted more that they realized that they got to fully commit. Yeah. And when they did, you know, being a fast follow doesn't mean you can't find your, your place in the market. And that has worked well, right? Even though there may have been some bumps or stumbles along the way, right? It's a, it's a huge, um, you know, a distribution connection point for, for players today. So, um, okay. You said you had something you were going to say about well, when it, when, So when the Wii was introduced, um, I was in Japan and Mr. Iwata took me aside. He said, I have something to show you. And so he checked me into this cubicle and he just handed me this controller and up the screen comes and here's this weeble looking person. He says, play tennis. Mm -hmm. So I do, and I'm playing tennis. And I'm. you asked me earlier if I play games, I do, but I would not consider myself, I'm definitely a casual player mm -hmm. um, for lack of time. And the precision of which and what I felt in that controller when I played and when that I hit that ball, it felt like I was hitting it in real life. Right. And I looked at him because at first I thought, oh God, that character has got these, you know, looks like this. Like, how do I, you know, I'm going to have to tell him I think that doesn't look too good. But then I played it and I just looked at him and he's like, you like it? I said, I love it. <laughs> And he's like, okay, so let's go. And we went into a room and we, you know, conversed and talked about, we looked at an array of controllers and he brought those to Europe. We had another meeting, looked at an array of controllers, but the challenge from a public, from a perception point of view, I thought, how are we going to launch this? Because at that point we were perceived, we were the, we were the profitable company at that point, Microsoft and Sony were not profitable, but the race was on. And we were definitely looking like the last, you know, a donkey that was far behind trying to gallop against these elegant horses. Mm -hmm. And so um, I said to Mr. Awada, you know, I'm going to, we're going to put together kind of a risky plan and we're going to present it to you. And you can tell us if you agree. I just knew that if we came out with a system where you're flapping your arms and doing all this stuff that the analysts would have said, sell that stock because they were already writing things like put Mario onto Microsoft's hardware. They should, Nintendo shouldn't make hardware anymore. And, you know, we just couldn't have that because that's not ever going to be part of what the company does. Right. Um, at least as I can see. So we introduced only the controller and the experience first. We did not show the hardware for a very long time. Right. And then, and then Mr. Awada introduced the hardware and we showed at E3, you know, three different, three or four different colors. So we did it very slowly and strategically um, and it could have fallen on its nose and he approved the plan. And I just was so grateful. And I always joke that I would be so seriously not have my company Zebra if it had not gone well, but it did. It did. And it was brilliant. And again, it changed the way we thought about games and, and really brought, I'll share one quick one with you. My, parents called me one evening it was like 11 30 at night it was a wednesday my wife and i had just gotten you know kids to bed dishes done you know watch something getting ready you know in bed to go to sleep and the phone rings and they're like hey we're trying to play this game on the wii but uh we have friends of right now and we can't get the other two controllers to connect and i was like what are you, what are you talking like why are you calling me right and i said Tell me what you're playing. They told me, and, and I said, "Oh, it's a two-player game. It's not four. Okay, you gotta go. Bye." And just hang up the phone. And I was like, 
it completely <laughs> changed the dynamic of discussing video games where my parents, right, who are in their, you know, late 60s, early 70s are sitting around playing, you know, Something the Wii with their friends. But that speaks to, again, the, the uh, universal. That's why we took it to the senior, that's why we took it to senior citizen. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. There is a rumor that part of uh, the initial uh, marketing program was kind of like the the kind of Tupperware party type of thing where some systems were sent to some influencers for them to show their friends and, and neighbors like what this thing was. Was that true or is that just your Here's the deal. It's, it's in relation to the being the donkey in this horse race. Um. I said, we cannot go to the media first with this. They're really down on us right now because they don't think we're looking so good and they don't see that we're making any changes. And here we're going to come with this box where you're flapping your arms and like, or you're not your legs, but you're flapping your arms and yelling. And so we need to go to the people first. We need to experience this with people before the media ever even get to touch it. And that was really unique at the time. Traditionally, you go to press first. They're the first to see things. They analyze it for you. They write about it. We went into senior citizen homes, and I remember standing in one. We went to all over the country. We all split up and went to different markets. And I remember saying, I'm, I'm not here for your kids, your grandkids. I'm not here for your kids. I'm here for you. And we're going to play Brain Age today on the DS, and we're going to bowl. And they just couldn't believe it because, you know, they're part of a, the forgotten part of our society. It's part of our society that I just despise. And they were up, you know, bowling and just hooting and hollering and laughing. And I was ready to bring in the vodka. They had so much fun. <laughs> and it brought those people to life. So you get that generation. And then we did um, in-home events for people that were really early influencers. So we said, you invite, you know, 10 of your greatest friends. And we're going to come to your home. And we're going to set it up and let you experience it. And you're going to tell us what you think. And so the word started to spread from the bottom up. We did several other things. We went to other places. We did, you know, ground level work on up. So it started to spread virally. So there was third party evidence mm -hmm. that this was a total hit. I mean, I think right. the press was really tired of hearing Karen Kaplan say, well, you know, we're really doing good here. Uh, Cause we were still making, you know, lots of high sales and prof very profitable stock, right. you know, great stock, but, um, we need to have that third party support. And so it is in fact true. It wasn't quite Tupperware, but it's it's true. And then we talked to the press about it. That's awesome. Okay, I've asked um, anybody that does have some questions to type, to type into the chat here. So in before we do that, I wanna wrap up with a few things that I'd really love to go and hit on. First is, you know, Nintendo is home to and led by, you know, a ton of iconic, you know, people, right? Shigeru Miyamoto, nor Arakawa, Howard Lincoln, Howard Phillips, you know, all these folks. Um, but a, a roster of men was not uncommon, right, in, in those companies during the time. But being one of the only women in really the upper executive ranks, along with your team, right, that included Gail Tilden mm -hmm, and, and Beth Whelan mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and Leslie Horner, what leadership advice can you maybe give our audience yeah, exactly regarding story. diversity and inclusion? Um. Like checking our biases and being mindful and to your point about being I inclusive. I have to say, I, I just, you know, I don't know if this is advice or if it's just the good luck that I in particular have had. I just, for those individuals, and I did have plenty of, you know, this guy from IT, I hope your computer breaks so I can get under your desk again and all that garbage, you know, you just ignore it. And I was so focused on the work and I tried so hard to make my, I was so serious about it and so serious about us winning and doing amazing things and making our consumers really happy that I just didn't leave any room in the room when I was talking about it to be anything other than having my idea heard. Mm -hmm. And if my idea wasn't going to be heard at that table, I was going to find a different way for it to be heard by an individual at the table. Yeah. So I just, 
I, I believe I earned my way there by bringing smart ideas that worked. Yeah. I also have to say I knew my area very well and others did not know my area. Yep. So yeah. I was an expert at the table and I didn't know their areas, right? Mm -hmm. So you have a bunch of experts of different areas coming together. So I had the, the blessing of that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you, if you show up really dead serious and you are confident in what you know and what you do, it's, I just, it was clear that I didn't have room for any of the other garbage. You know, that's before you and I even had the chance to meet. I mean, the reputation that you had built for yourself in the industry, I mean, there wasn't you're anybody so, that did so it. Sweet. No, no, I, look, this is not just me saying this. This is, you know, r r go back and look at, the, at all of the interviews you've done over the year, over the years, you know, Everybody knew Perrin. Perrin was a no BS person. You knew your stuff yeah. going in. You, I mean, uh, just incredibly engaged. And even, you know, addressing some, you know, uh, uh, interesting questions that people had of, well, you know, how much memory is available in this week? And you're like, it's just like cleaning out your fridge. Just <laughs> stuff that you're not playing right now. You go ahead you need and to get rid of it. <laughs> get rid of it. Download this if you want to play. Oh, and by the way, when you're ready to go play it again, you can download it for free again right off the service. So what's the problem? And it was all yeah. of those. Well, uh, 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 you know, face so parent. You know, um, it's. Uh, I do party hard. I have quite a sense of humor, though. However, you are you are <laughs> absolutely amazing. All right, I've got one other question about Nintendo, and then we're going to ask a couple of quick questions about what you. What it was now. like to work with Miyamoto. Of course, I would be remiss. I if just I did. have to say, I can get teary. I have never worked with a more humble person. He spoke for the first time ever at GDC when it was back in santa san jose and it was nothing yeah. yep and he had to give the a best keynote. era the best era of Jesus. best era amen, Fairmont Hotel. Bro amen brother <laughs> and he we coached him for a couple of days me and jim merrick you know jim yep yep um and then he gets up to speak and before he even starts everybody gets up to stand for him and they're clapping and he's just like i can tell he's just like i don't know what to do with this and so then he gives his presentation and then they clap again and standing ovation, a packed room. And he's like, I don't know what to do with this. And then afterwards, you know, I whisk him off to lunch and people come by and they want his autograph and stuff. And he's just saying to me, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand. And I simply just said, Mr. Miyamoto, every person in that room chose this industry because of you. Okay. Yep. And he just thought that was so sweet. He has no ego. He is the nicest human, sweetest person. He was so sad when I left and I was so sad to depart from him. He's the, he is everything that you think he is. That's wonderful. And, and that, that tracks with everything I've, I've ever heard and the yeah. brief interaction that, that I've had with him. Just somebody He dreams games yeah. in his sleep. He's a, he's a young man in an older man's body. Yep. And an amazing banjo player. For those that don't know, yes, he he's is. also an yes, accomplished yes. banjo player. Okay, Sorry. real quickly, post-Nintendo, you founded your own PR firm along with some colleagues from Nintendo. Beth Wells, yes, 14 Nintendo. years. A Amazing. team of 30. We love Amazing. what we do Amazing. for all over the U.S. We love it. So tell us about some of the clients that you've developed you know, brands for currently. Oh, gosh. We work in everything from VR to AR to AI say, to Metaverse. What are, what are the two to three that, that really stick out in your, in your mind that you're most... I'm not going to pick. Okay, don't pick. Because we love them all. We work with indies. We work with companies you don't yet know about. We work with all the big brands many of the big brands but we do er, it we do everything from emerging technology to video games to streaming to tabletop um and it's everything from integrated marketing to pure pr and we love them all yeah. and and we work globally and and we love it and gang this is why perrin is the consummate PR and marketing person. That was the uh, perfect right answer. Uh, so, um, and uh, so it's just been wonderful to see you continue to grow your expertise, have your influence felt, you know, around the industry. I know quite a number of the people at, at these different companies um, that, that you're working with. And 
you know how we all feel about you. But I do want to say this one last thing. Um, you're the president and founder of Saving Great Animals, which focuses on dog rescue and adoption. So My pride why'd, you start, why'd you start it? How do you I it? really quickly, I'll tell you so we can get to the other questions. I was one day at Nintendo in a meeting that was starting late, and one of the employees there, a young woman, was complaining about this puppy she'd gotten, and she left it locked in the bathroom and how it was ruining and tearing everything apart. And she was probably working 10 hours a day. And I thought to myself, when did you get a puppy? What are you thinking about locking it up all day? I mean, are you kidding? And later in the day, I was at another meeting that started late. And I was talking to Dan, and he was like, yeah, we're thinking of getting a dog. And I'm like, well, mm -mm, mashed him. That dog went on to have a fantastic long life. And um, then about two weeks later, someone approached me and said, this gentleman's going to Afghanistan. And he has two dogs and he doesn't know what to do with them. And I said, well, I have a friend. It was a German shepherd in the lab. I said, I have my friend just lost their German shepherd. So I'm just going to ask them. So I called them and said, would you be willing to meet this dog? Like, it, there's a lab, but you don't have to worry about the lab. Just meet this dog. Rainy, horrible rain, Seattle night, muddy night. We get there, bring the dogs in. They're spending all the time. And I'm like, you know, again, no pressure on the lab. Just, you know, what do you think? And my friend Mark looks and he goes, well, why wouldn't we take both? And I'm like falling on my knees grateful because I'm like, I don't know how to help these animals otherwise. And then I thought, OK, there's just something here and there must be many more animals like this. I volunteered for a local organization, thought there was a better way to do this, started my own Saving Great Animals. We are 9,000 animals in. Fantastic have an amazing volunteer team and we have saved so many lives that would not be here and they are all perfect and i just want to say rescue dogs are dogs that are perfect that have been let down by humans there's nothing wrong with them mm -hmm. that's incredible that you spent so much time and passion into caring for others and and rescuing these animals. I will share with everyone here. Um, Perrin and I uh, and a few other friends were having dinner in the Presidio before going mm -hmm. over to the, uh, you know, the Lucasfilm campus there for an event. And as we're walking over, there were three or four dogs that were being walked and Perrin just beelines away from our group <laughs> and is like running across the, the small street there into the park. And we're like, what is she doing? And you just greeted each one of those dogs oh before we God. had to turn around and run back in to, to the event. So it is truly uh, awesome <laughs> to see you, you care and, and build, you know, uh, something I can't that help it. <laughs> I can't help it. <laughs> All righty. So if we have any questions, it's going to bring them in. I do have one question here that's popped into the chat. So, um, and this goes back to some of the things you talked about before with regard to how Nintendo thinks about, um, you know, the hardware side of their business. So do you think Nintendo missed an opportunity in, in the mobile gaming market? Um, or what about streaming where, uh, we're seeing Microsoft and Sony kind of doing that, that streaming. Do you, in a future where hardware may be less prominent? So two parts to that question. The first is, do you think they missed an opportunity in, in mobile or do you think they're just charting their own path as they've always done? I think that Mr. Iwata was uh, reticent to recognize the importance that the Apple store had. Mm -hmm. He continued to really think that handheld mobile and app store experiences were different. And they are. They definitely are. Mm -hmm. I mean, the DS exists for a reason. Right. So he was not wrong there, but it delayed it delayed the further progression in that area. And then ultimately, you know, the company did put some games on there that were fairly me mediocre to kind of test stuff out. But I don't think that they've missed the mobile market in them. That's not really what they do. They do handheld mobile. Right. And as far as streaming, you know, I can't speak for them at the moment. All I can say is knowing them as I know them is that they will find a way that works for the people that love their products the most. And it's not going to be the way that's identical to what everybody else is doing. They do what they do and they do what they do really well. Yeah. Nope. That is again, evident and a hallmark of everything that they've uh, 
you know, ever done, right? Nintendo's going yeah. to do it their way. And their philosophy is just different. As you said, they don't compete with these other companies. They exist in the same world that they happen to exist in, right? But right. they're different. I mean, look at when Switch launched. Everyone's like, this is like a mobile phone in a device. It's like, you can't, don't look at the hardware. Look at what they're doing with the hardware, right? And right. again, they made it totally a Nintendo invention, which is just phenomenal. Somebody also posted in here, full credit to the NOA culture has always been super well welcoming to the Amazon team. And this person has been supporting them for three years and misses the sushi in Cafe Mario. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so um, I don't think we have any additional questions that are coming I, in. I will just say that um, Nintendo viewed Amazon and its growth with awe. And I think there's a great appreciation for Amazon as well. And I do think that there are some similarities. You know, Jeff constructed things with a certain, you know, with his principles. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those are very much aligned with Nintendo's principles, as you said earlier. Yeah. And I think Am I think he's done, he and now Andy have done a, a, a really fantastic job with Amazon. Awesome. And all of the things, I mean, the world cannot exist without Amazon. I will say that an AWS runs is the backbone of so much. Yeah. They're very different companies, but the same kind of ethos exists. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, I'm excited about our ability to continue telling our story, not just what we do, but how we do it and why. Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. what better place to do it than in the games industry. Right. Yeah. So, and I just will, I will just last say that. I'm thrilled that AWS has you joining them, Chris. You oh. bring so much energy and so many smarts and such history and so much goodness that they're lucky to have you. Oh, Parrot, thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. Thank you, are you so much. Smart, smart, so smart. <laughs> Sometimes I can't figure out how you do what you do. Uh, that's, you know, it's, uh, you know, with too much time, uh, you know, focusing on all of the, the tech bits here, right? So, um, all right. Um, since we didn't have any other questions, I got one final one for you. What would you say is probably your greatest hope for the future of of the games industry? You know, with all of the headwinds that it's faced, with the changes that's gone through, with all that you've experienced and seen and continue to experience and work on today, what would you say is, what what, what would you like to see the industry do going forward that maybe it hasn't fully um, expressed or taken uh, the, the opportunity to, to, to create? This I know that's a gonna, big question. Well, this is, I mean, experiential. It's on one hand, I could discuss experiential. On the other hand, I can discuss like the human, the human form. I'm gonna just mention the human form and this may be a dream in the sky. I have seen, we all have seen, not only in gaming, but in this world in the last, we're still in it, that people hide behind whatever they can to share their, their hate, their meanness, their disparaging remarks, their cruelness, their just foul nature. And if they hate themselves that much, I feel deeply, deeply sad and would love to help those people and, and hope that help is sought. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe that it is our job to allow them to take down everybody else or take down individuals who then are, are taken to the brink of suicide or suicide or, or a variety of other things. The cruelty that we see that is allowed you know, in gaming. And I know that companies are working really hard on ways to vet out and block out those people. It's yep. still a lot of work. I think gaming is supposed to bring peace, joy, happiness, exhilaration, challenge, fun, determination, community, and all those wonderful things. That's the purpose of it. And it's why we escape to go there. Mm -hmm. And, and then for the art form and all those other things that comes with it, I just think we need to strip out as much as we can the people that bring others down. I don't think they have a right to anything but bring themselves. 
Yeah. And that, that and you are correct that, you know, a lot of companies are working on those types of solutions, including AWS, about understanding sentiment and understanding nuance yes. and context in language to make sure that we are helping people to elevate themselves and to, um, you know, understand the impact that they may have on themselves, their the, the, the culture, you know, and the people they engage with. Um, and so, you know, I, I agree that there is an element there, but I'm going to share with you one quick story that um, looks at the, the incredible possibility on the other side of this. When we were doing the Art of Video Games exhibition, Don Daglo was in being, love, you know, I love Don as well. Dear friend, yes. And I was interviewing him and I asked him, you know, why, um, you know, what is his hope? for the technology. And he went back and talked about the fact that they worked on Neverwinter Nights, right? First Dungeons and mm -hmm. Dragons game on AOL. Mm -hmm. And he got it, he recanted, uh, recounted the story where he had, he said, we got this beautiful handwritten letter from this woman who said that the game saved her life. And what had happened was um, she was in an abusive relationship and her, her partner was becoming increasingly, you know, violent or controlling to the point where she would come home from work and he would lock her basically in the bedroom and he would see that she's playing this game, but didn't realize it was an online game. She became so comfortable with the community that she was playing with that eventually she shared with them what was going on in real life. And this is a person who's going to work every day and still coming home, you know, walking past people on the street, possibly a police officer still coming home, did not feel comfortable in engaging in any of that interaction or explaining what was happening on, but to the people that she met playing online. Those people helped her to get out, get to a safe, uh, you know, home and help to get him arrested. And she's like, your game literally gave me the community mm. and the people that saved my life. And the confidence. That's right. And he's like, that's why I'm hopeful for what we do. We are still yeah. so young as, as a medium and an art form. And we've dealt with an onslaught of technology that, it, that most other forms of storytelling and communication have never had to deal with in as short a time frame. We're going to continue to get better. Right. I'm yeah. with you and you know how I feel that this is really about making sure that whatever we build in the world makes the lives of people who create art better and yes. the lives of people who engage in that art better. And that's yes. what we're going to do. So, yes. Perrin, I know we are up against the top of the hour. Thank you so we much. We used the time well. We did. we did use the time well. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for everybody that, that joined in the uh, the conversation. We're going to go ahead and post this. I'm surprised back. anyone showed up. I appreciate oh, it. please. Please. Once I, I, people are coming out of the woodwork. Oh, my goodness. You're interviewing her? I was like, heck yes. Heck yes. Uh, so, um, you're darn sweet. Thank you. As are you. So I'm looking forward to... Uh, seeing you soon and please uh, yeah we, we, we've got another game night uh to go but again parent thank you for taking so much of your time this morning with us and thank uh, you chris it's wonderful we'll see you soon absolutely okay, have a everybody. great day take thanks care. everybody